wish to thank the Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies for this privilege and honor that I have to speak on the lectureship once again this year. The topic for discussion is Thomas and Alexander Campbell. You know, there's something to be said about those who down through the ages of, of people who have had over the years trying to come to an understanding of God's Word. And although there's been such a struggle down through the ages, we realize that there are so many things that we are to be thankful for. The fact that those men and women who have gone on before us have done many wonderful things in learning the truth of God's Word. We often take for granted of the religious things and the religious nature of what they have done for us. And religiously speaking, we owe it a great debt to them for having done the things that they have done. Tonight, we are at this time, we want to discuss the many truths and we want to embrace the struggles that some have gone through down through the years. I recognize and understand that there are those that do not really appreciate all that those down through the, through the history of studying of God's Word have gone through. For example, in the book of Acts chapter and verse 7, we have an incident where Stephen, the first martyr that we have record of, gave his life in defense of the gospel, trying to teach the others of how important it is and vital it is to study and to maintain and to realize that the law had changed that we're now under a new covenant that our Savior had established. The problem was that the council did not, want to, uh, did not want to go along with what Stephen had to say. They ignored the truth, and because they ignored the truth, rather than accept it, they did the next best thing, or at least in their mindset they did. They took the life of Stephen by stoning him to death. We also read of the Apostle Paul, who, when he was teaching to young, or wrote his letter to young Timothy, he pointed out that he was one that was very injurious to the church, that he persecuted the church, but he did it ignorantly in unbelief. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, he later let them know that he persecuted the church. In fact, later on, he told how that he was the chief of sinners. And if the Apostle Paul could get forgiveness of sin, certainly we should be grateful that we too can have forgiveness of sin. We enjoy the benefits of so many who down through the ages have given their life, who have fought to the death the teaching of God's Word. It's a sad commentary on mankind to ignore the loss that others have done down through the ages. And because of their great loss, because of their great struggles, we benefit from what they learn. This passion that they had, those that go on, have gone on before us, trying to learn what they had done. Studying the Restoration Period can benefit us by learning from the experiences of others who truly wanted to do what God commanded. People had been restrained from doing anything different than the leaders of that time, day and time would allow them to do. They wanted to have it their way, and they would do whatever they could in order to establish themselves. Realizing things were not making sense in so many ways, changes had to be made. Protests were being made. Arguments against the councils and against those who upheld the denominational system of Catholicism and, and Presbyterianism. God was able to help be served by the conscience of these good men and women who would live to, through their life the Word of God. Today we'll look at two men specifically, those who made a difference during the Restoration Movement. They were a father and son rest Restorationers themselves. They made haste. They did what they could in order to make corrections in an erring way. They are Thomas Campbell, the father, and Alexander Campbell, his son. We want to look together at the impact that they made for the good of the work of this father and son team. These two men who lived faithfully and endured many great hurts and harms, even endangering their own lives, to be able to do what they did, and we received the benefits of it. I'd like to start out with Thomas Campbell, the father. Thomas Campbell lived for a number of years, uh, and we realize, or we know that his birth was uh, this way. He was born on February 1st in 1763 in Ireland. His father, his name was Archibald, and his father was a soldier in the British Army. His father was a strict member of the Church of England. He upheld it because of the British nature and the, the teaching that was there, and because of this, we, we know that his father really wanted Thomas to, to uphold that same teaching and truth. Thomas had three brothers and four sisters. 
the brothers were born, but the sisters all died in infancy. And one of the strange characteristics of this, or one of the things that I thought was kind of interesting, was that each child, each daughter, that as they were born, they lived for a short period of time. In their infancy, they died. The next one that came along was named Mary as well. And the one after that was named Mary. And the one after that was named Mary. And so Thomas was left with three, uh, three brothers. The early life of Thomas Campbell was not an easy one, no doubt. Thomas Campbell lived in the, in, in under the confines of the military. His father, being a soldier in the British Army, allowed him to be able to be taught in a military regimental school. No doubt the, te the uh, discipline and the, uh, the uh, course that was being, the courses that were being taught were well uh, solidified. They were, they were specific. They were disciplined uh, type classes. No doubt they were strict in their teaching and their training and the expectation that was going to be coming from the student. Early in his youth, he acquired this sincere love for the scriptures. Thomas desired to know more and more about them in his lifetime. And as he grew older, he became more religious. His impressions were deepened more and more as he read more and more of the scripture, as he came to an understanding more perfectly of what God expected of mankind, especially of him. His desire was so strong that one day when he was praying for help, he found himself walking in a field and he felt this divine presence come over him. He couldn't explain it quite perfectly, but in this divine peace that he received, he had this calling or what he thought was a calling. He believed himself to be specially called from a divine influence. Perhaps it was because of all the studying that he did as that Holy Spirit worked on him through that holy and divine word. Thomas's father was not happy of his religious change. Because of his ties with the Church of England, it, he, he did not approve very much of this change that came about on Thomas, but Thomas continued to study and learn. He then began to preach for the succession church of the Presbyterian faith in that day and time, and the succession church, the one that departed from the full uh, born Presbyterian church, there were those splits that took place because of disagreements in their teaching and in their, in their uh, convictions. His resolve was to help the un unenlightened. He wanted people to know the truth. And because he wanted them to know the truth, he established an English academy for them. He became an instructor and taught them. During the process of time, he became married to a woman by the name of Jane Cornell, Cor Cornigal. Uh, in June of 1787, uh, they became husband and wife. Her ancestry was that of French. Uh, she was a French Huguenot who sought refuge in Scotland due to the Edict of Nantes by Louis XIV, and then they migrated to England because the persecution was so great there, they had to flee for their lives. They lived strictly by with all, what they thought the law was as far as the law of God was concerned. When she was seven years old, her, her father passed away, and she was raised by her mother from then on. She was brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, as it was declared, and well known for her devotion to religious duties as a student of the Bible, as one who truly trusted in God's word. Thomas found his wife to be a very encouraging helpmate. She helped him in all that he said and all that he did while he was preaching and teaching his schooling courses. His, or her parents were strict Calvinists after the, uh, the Huguenot way was. Uh, she was educated in harmony of that teaching or with that teaching. And of course, we understand that Calvinism is wrong, that it was not uh, true to God's word. The strict training proved, however, to be beneficial when she was teaching their children as they were growing up. She held to that strict regime of, of instructing the children. Now, the education and religious training of Thomas Campbell went on this wise. Thomas Alexander, being a succeeder Presbyterian minister, wanted to know more and more. His education was begun early in his life, and it was a thorough education. As we mentioned, he, were, or he studied at that English regiment, or the British uh, Regimental uh, Academy. Uh, he learned those things, and later on in life, he entered into the University of Glasgow, where he graduated after the course. He entered into a divinity school at Whitburn for theological training. 
When he graduated from that divinity school, Thomas gave himself over to completely teaching and preaching God's word as he knew it. With all of his teaching and all of his preaching, however, there came a problem upon Thomas. He opened up a school of his own near Rich Hill in order to help support his family because he wasn't able to support him on his preaching salary. He not only did this, but he worked day and night. His duties at the school, his duty with the congregation were such that it strained him, that he became pale, that he started to, to become frail. Well, in April 8th of 1807, at the insistence of his doctor, he is instructed to leave for America, to go there to see if the climate there would be much better for him, that he would be healthier there. And so the plan was devised that he would go ahead of his family and he would check out the country to make sure that it was okay. So Alexander, his son, agrees to take control of the school while his father is gone overseas in America. Thomas, Thomas's plan was to go, and if he was pleased with the country, he would then uh, send for the family to come and follow suit. After about three months, in a letter dated May 27, 1807, Thomas wrote that he had arrived safely to America, and it was after a 35-day voyage. The letter that he'd sent called for the family to follow his directions when he left to be comfort to their mother, to study, and to pray. In that letter, we there was an excerpt that Thomas, or rather Alexander, had written in his journal. He must have thought it very important. And I have that quotation here in front of me, and I'd like to read it to you. Live to God, he said. Be, be devoted to him in heart and in all your understand, undertakings. Be a sincere Christian. Imbibe the doctrines. Obey the precepts. Copy the example and believe the promise of the gospel. And that you may do so, read it, study it, pray over it, embrace it as your heritage, your portion. Live by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, both for wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Above all things, attend to this, for without him you can do nothing, either to the glory of God or your own good. Some mighty strong words from Thomas Campbell to the family, in which Alexander took great pride in remembering it and writing it down. I'd like to stop here talking about Thomas and move into a little discussion about Alexander Campbell. Alexander Campbell, he was born in uh, September 12th, around September 12th in 1788. He died when, uh, uh, in the year of 1866. There are many things that were good or interesting about Thomas, or uh, rather Alexander, in his lifetime. First of all, he was the eldest of seven, seven children. He lived in such a way that uh, his father insisted on family training. His father, because of strict instructions that he had, also wanted his children to be strictly instructed, to have a good education, to be knowledgeable of God's word. In fact, it was such a strong thing, and of course being backed up by his wife, Jane, uh, Alexander would listen to what his mother and father would tell him. In fact, every member should memorize a portion of the Bible and recite it the evening, at the evening worship. They got together on a daily basis. They would discuss the Bible together as a family unit. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get families to do that today? <clears throat> if we could encourage families to take part and study from God's Word, to make it a very real part of their life, everyday life, having a time to sit down and to study from God's Word, even if it was for 25 or 30 minutes a night. Not only this, but questions and remarks were made. On the Lord's Day, the scriptures were rehearsed. The things that they studied through the week on the Lord's Day before they would go to worship, they would talk about these things. Every member was expected to attend the meeting. And as they came to the meeting, they were supposed to be paying close attention to what was being done. Following the Lord's Day service, each one was to do a number of things. First of all, they were to give an account of the lesson text. Where was the message from? Not only that, but they were to give an account of the discourse. What did the preacher actually say? What were the points that he made that really stuck in your mind? In other words, were you really paying attention to what was being said? They had to give an account of the leading points of the lesson. The main pr proposition, or, uh, pr uh, propositions of what the lesson was all about, they had to have them handily in, in mind. 
They're able to be able to recite those things as they study together as a family. He would later praise his mother, that is Alexander Campbell, would later praise his mother for her example in training him and his siblings. See, Alexander truly loved what his mother had done for him. And his father, Thomas, would trust his wife to follow through and make sure they received that good training. What a society we would have today if that would only be practiced, even in part, how wonderful it would be. The early life of Alexander Campbell seems to be like any other boy growing up in that day and time, in that period of time. First of all, Alexander loved the outdoors. He loved to go fishing. He loved to go swimming. Oftentimes, he would like to go out and, and catch birds, either with a net or with a, with a dog, in order to have those birds for a meal. Not only that, he was also known for, and this is a good tidbit to know, I think, he had some extraordinary large hands, which came in handy when snowball season came about, because he could make some really big snowballs, and he could hurl them with force, and, and with a great force. His parents approved of Alexander's recreation. They thought it was proper for him to be outdoors and to exercise and to get rid of some of that nervous energy that he had. They figured it was, help, it was necessary for his health and for his vigor. Later on in life, Tom or Alexander got married. Now, Alexander Campbell, by the way, was married twice. His first wife was uh, Margaret Brown, and they were united in marriage on March 12, 1811. Together, they, uh, or rather the second time that he was married was to Selena Bakewell on July 31st, 1828. Margaret Brown was born January 29th, 1791. She and Alexander had eight children together. Margaret died on October 27th, 1827 of tuberculosis. All eight of her children, that, are, that is the children of Alexander and Margaret Brown, or Margaret Campbell, all eight of their children preceded Alexander in death. Selena Blackwell was born in November 12, 1802. Um, she and Alexander had six children together. That means Alexander had 14 children altogether. Uh, Selena died June 28, 1897, and she outlived Alexander by 31 years. Two of the six children that Selena and Alexander had died or preceded Alexander in his death. So only four remained after Alexander passed from this life. Prior to dying, Margaret Campbell, and this is another one of those tidbit, tidbit facts that, that I ran across from my studies. And I thought it was kind of interesting that uh, Margaret Campbell was the one that suggested that Alexander marry Selena when she passed from this life. And so he wa she wanted to make sure that he was okay as well. And so apparently uh, he took Margaret's advice and, and married Selena to be his wife. The education of Alexander was a little like his father's, of course, sitting at his mother and father's feet early on in his life. Alexander went to school and was boarded for a while at Market Hill and two or three years in the town of Newry where two of his uncles had, had lived. Upon returning home, his father endeavored to superintend Alexander's education from then on. He wanted to make sure that he knew exactly what he needed to learn and have in order to fulfill the obligation to become an evangelist or a, a good Christian man. Alexander, however, was more into sports. He liked that physical exercise. He liked fishing and he liked hunting. As I mentioned, he was like any other young man. He liked the outdoorsy type things. And so at, nine, at age of nine, uh, one of his new assignments was to learn the French language. This was added to his studies. Now, it may have been in part because his mama was of French descent, and uh, she may have spoken French every now and then, but whatever the court case may be, he was, in he was required to learn French. So on a warm day, he took his French book and, and le or took his French lesson with him, and he went out in the pasture, and under a shade tree, he fell asleep studying French. Well, unbeknownst to him at the time, a cow came moseying along, and it snatched up that book and ate it before Alexander was fully awake, before he knew what happened. And so Alexander had to go home, and of course, instead of telling his daddy that his, da that his dog ate the homework, he had to tell him that the cow ate his homework. Alexander, his father, finally decided to break his son of his books. 
he wanted to make sure that his son wanted to appreciate those books more. And so what he did was he put him to work on the farm to subdue his love of sports, to tone that down. The problem was that Alexander seemed to like the field labor more than the books. He'd rather be out there working with his hands and, 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 and getting that exercise that way than studying from those books that he found a little boring, supposedly. This lasted for several years. He became stout in his labors and the farm, and, and he turned to study. He decided to get back into the books, and on November 9th, 1808, he entered Glasgow or the University of Glasgow. And of course, this was following a shipwreck, which we're going to talk about here in just a moment. He had some, some of the same instructors, by the way, at Glasgow, the University of Glasgow. He had some of the same instructors that his father had uh, years earlier, which I thought was kind of interesting. He still found time, however, with his many, many studies at the university, he still found time to read during those studies. He found time to take up books and study and meditate upon them. To attain excellence in his composing of sermons, he observed the following from school in his sermon preparation. Now, I'd like for all the students especially to kind of listen carefully to what the uh, uh, great Alexander Campbell did as far as his preparation for getting his lessons together. I think it's some good points in here for him to, for us, for us all, in fact, to understand, to help us to be better students of the Bible. First of all, he said, the preacher must be a man of piety. He must be a one who has the instruction and the salvation of mankind sincerely at heart. Jesus gave us instruction to go and preach, to teach all nations, that we were to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He gave us his word that he would be with us always, even to the end of the earth. He told us that we need to be baptizing these folks. It was very important. And as Alexander pointed out here, we need to have mankind sincerely in our heart. We need to realize how important it is to take care of those lost souls out there, that we can't underestimate how powerful that word is, and it needs to be passed along. He said a preacher must be a man of modest and simple manners, and in his public performances and general behavior must conduct himself so as to make his people sensible that he has their temporal and eternal welfare more at heart than anything else. We have to show that compassion. We have to show that comfort. We have to show the people how vital and how important their souls are to us and to the Father. He said that preacher must be well instructed moral, morally and religiously. And in, original, and in the original tongues of what the scriptures are written, for without them he can hardly be qualified to explain scripture or to teach religion and morality to them. Yes, these are high standards that he put upon himself but not only upon himself, but for all preachers. This preacher must be proficient in his own language as well, as to be able to express every doctrine and to precept and utmost simplicity and without anything in his dic diction, either uh, finical or on one hand or vulgar on the other hand. He needed to be very well attuned to what his job and duty was. He said a sermon should be composed with regularity, and unity of design, so that all parts may have a mutual and natural connection, that it should not consist of many heads, neither should it be very long. A sermon ought to be pronounced with gravity, modesty, and meekness, and so as to be distinctly heard by all the audience. It seems he never stopped studying once he picked up his books. It was like a, a contagion to him. He wanted to know what that truth was. Alexander Campbell eventually would move to America like his father, as his father sent word for them to all come. And it was on September 20th, 1808, the date the family of Thomas Campbell would depart for America. Alexander, at the old age of 21, having gathered his mother, his siblings, and belongings set out to the journey for America. Because the ship was not ready and the winds were not favorable, they did not set sail until September 28, 1808, and this was eight days after they arrived. The ship's captain and crew were very young, very inexperienced, and this would prove to be a factor later on in their voyage to America. 
On the evening of October 7th, 1808, the ship having been anchored in Lockendall Bay was blown to the rocky shore and it was wrecked. Again, that inexperienced crew, the young, uh, the captain uh, that was very young and inexperienced, they didn't secure the ship properly and it drifted into the rocks and it was wrecked there. Well, following the shipwreck, it was decided to winter in Glasgow, Scotland. And so Thomas went back to the ship. He got all the books that he could salvage and all the uh, possessions that he could uh, salvage and get them all together and took them to shore. And as they were on their way back to Glasgow, notice it took them a number of days to get there. In fact, it was 27 days to travel to Glasgow, but they arrived on November 3rd, 1808. I think about that 27 day journey back to Glasgow from uh, where they were at. And in that travel there, I, I happen to remember that Thomas Campbell, his entire journey to America from uh, Ireland was some 35 days. So another eight days journey yet would have been the time frame for them to arrive in America, but it wasn't to happen. Alexander Campbell attended Glasgow University until the classes were over for the year in May. And so from November to May, Thomas attended the University of Glasgow, getting an education there. On August 14th, 1809, 300 days after the shipwreck there, uh, the anchor on the ship was weighed and the Campbell family was on their way to America. It sounds like everything is just fine. It sounds like everything's going to go off without a hitch now, but you'd be wrong if you thought that. You see, after three days sailing, the ship sprung a leak. Not only a leak was sprung, but the next week there were storms, there was lightning, the quarter railing was broken off, and the tiller rope on the ship had given way, and there was, uh, it was hard to control the ship without that tiller rope being securely fastened. Not only that, but then came the sails being torn, and some were lost. Uh, the ones that remained were torn very badly. On September 29th, however, 1809, they cast anchor in New York Harbor. They had to stay in the harbor for a period of time. They had to go past the quarantine period. The doctors would come in and examine to make sure that they weren't bringing any diseases with them as they came from a foreign country. They checked to make sure that all was well. And after the, uh, the quarantine period of time, they were allowed to go into New York and they made their journey toward Washington, Pennsylvania to meet up with Thomas Campbell. This was a journey. It wasn't a pleasant journey, an easy journey, but it was a journey of 350 miles over the Allegheny Mountains on rough roads. You realize this was back in the 1800s. They didn't have the super highways that we have nowadays. They didn't have the good automobiles and, and vehicles to travel with. They had those wagons with hard wheels. They had the, the old beaten roads and hard roads that they traveled on. And if there was rain, then they'd turn into mud. Uh, so this journey was not only a treacherous journey, but it was a long, hard journey. Travel was about 30 miles a day. So it was about 10, 12, may, maybe 13 days of journeying to get to where Thomas was. When they were about two days or three days out from Washington, Pennsylvania, Thomas was getting impatient, and he headed on his way to meet up with his family. And there, after not having seen them for two years, embraces them all. And what a great family reunion that must have been. I would have loved to have been there to hear the excitement of those children, of the son, the wife, and the husband, all gathered together there, and how happy and pleased they were that they'd finally been reunited after this long period of time, two years. I'd like to stop here for a moment, and I'd like to move on to some of the writings of Thomas and Alexander Campbell. They have a lot of things in common. They were both prolific writers. They were both studious and knowing God's will. And Thomas Campbell had written something uh, in his, with his own hand back in 1809, September 7th, to be, to be honest. And this was called the Declaration and Address of the Christian Association of Washington. One of the most important documents of, documents of history, according to, to some disciples, that many have said. And in this document, there was many truths. Now, this is a long document, and we're not going to go over every aspect. I just wanted to touch base on some of the highlights. First of all, Alexander had read this document, 
and he dedicated his life to its principles. He wanted to be one of those that would enforce and embrace these principles because they were so true. There are certain parts of it, and there are actually four main components of it. The first was the declaration, actually stating briefly the plan and purpose of the Christian Association of Washington. Why did they form this association? Number two was the address signed by Thomas Campbell and Thomas Axon, giving an extended argument uh, for the unity of the Christians and the amplifying the principles on which the church began to uh, uh, can regain its original unity and purity. The third thing was the appendix that was in this. It explained several points in this address. The fourth component of this document was a postscript. This was written some three months later, suggesting steps to be taken for the promotion of the movement. The declaration states the aim and the means of promoting the movement. And who could argue against these things? The aim. It was for unity, peace, and purity. These are the three things that this declaration was really after. This is what their aim was, to get this peace back, to get this unity that all would be united in, in the true religion, what God's word said, and to be pure of heart. That simply meant that the means by which they were going to do this was by rejecting human opinions. seems that that was the biggest cause for concern, returning to and holding fast by the original standard. The method of procedure is outlined under nine headings that that we say that, that are in that document. Again, we're not going to go over all of them, but the formation of a religious association, quote, for the sole purpose of promoting simple evangelical Christianity, free from all mixture of human opinions and inventions of men, unquote. A very noble thing, if you ask me, because this was a real difficult part of this document, the real difficult part of the religious people and the fervor that was going on around there was so much division over opinions and over inventions of men. Just like the Presbyterians deciding that we had to interview somebody and make sure they're worthy to partake of the, whole, of the uh, Lord's Supper. We know that the Christian Association of Washington is not a church, as they declared, but an organization to voluntarily advocate for the church reformation, quote-unquote. They also, in their... Um, instructions or in their uh, documentation here, wanted to make sure that everybody was on the same page. He says the church can give no new commandments where the scriptures are silent. And so, again, this is something that we find to be truthful. He, as I'm, I'm talking about Thomas Campbell here, his mindset was that division among Christians is a horrid evil. There's just no excuse, no reason why there should be this evil going on. Why we should not be united in Christ Jesus in the, in the words of God. Now, when we think about this declaration, like I said, there's so much written on it and there's so much that pertain to it, but we just don't have the time to go through it all at this time. I'm hoping to whet your appetite to go in and delve into these words. Because I want to talk about Thomas, or rather Alexander Campbell's writings right now. Now, Alexander Campbell was a writer. He's oftentimes asked questions and, uh, and had requests for different things, asked his opinions or his notes or his thoughts on certain matters. And in the Millennial Harbinger, which he was a writer, this is a great source of all the varieties of subjects that, uh, that Alexander had written about. There's a website out there that, that I ran across, and I think it's a very good website. Uh, I would like for it to be presented uh, in written form, but if you get the manual, it's in the outline there. Archive.org forward slash details forward slash writings Alex and 00 UNKN GOOG forward slash page forward slash N11 forward slash mode M O D E forward slash two up. And on this website here, there's all these documents of the things that Alexander had written down through the ages. And this is a very good resource to learn even more about Alexander Campbell and his writings. He also published a book or a magazine called The Christian Baptist in July 1st, 1823, and it lasted until 1830. And the purpose of this was simply to attack. He wanted to make attacks against those who were in the missionary societies and those that were busy with ecclesiastical organizations, things that were contrary to God's word, with the official clergy, those that 
profess to be of this denomination or this group of people. Uh, he wanted to attack them to show the error of their ways. He went against those creeds that they practiced and followed, which are unnecessary because after all, we have God's word. That's our creed book. Now, during this period of time, there were some good and bad things that went on. Again, I can't list everything. I can only go over a few points here, but one of the things is this statement. We've all heard it in times past. Where the scriptures speak, we speak. Where the scriptures are silent, we are silent. This is a statement of, of encouraging words to me because that's, after all, how we are supposed to live our lives in accordance with God's word. We're to embrace it. We're to love it. We're to be nurtured by it. We're to pass it along to others. We're to demonstrate in our everyday walk of life, in our speech, in our comings and goings. And so this was one of those big problems, as we'll see here. Alexander said, It requires but little reflection to discover that the fiercest disputes about religion are about what the Bible does not say, rather than about what it does say. They're arguing more over man's opinion than what the scriptures actually did teach. And so being a, a student of the Bible and realizing the Bible is silent on so many subjects, but it speaks grand volumes for so many others, people are spending more time on the supposos rather than, the no, than, rather than uh, speaking on what they should know. Baptism, they determined and discovered by scriptural study, was by immersion. And they adopted the name, quote-unquote, Christian, as their only proper name. We're not hyphenated Christians. We don't belong to a denomination. We're not Church of Christ Christians. We're not Baptist Christians. We're not Catholic Christians. We're simply Christians. Christians only based on the Bible definition of the term and obedience to that plan of salvation. Those who follow the Campbells, however, they got a bad name. They were called Campbellites by their critics. And of course, the name Campbellite was a name of derision a means by which they could run down those who would practice the Bible teaching of what the church taught. But they tried to ascribe that to the Campbells, that they're the ones that decided to start the Church of Christ when nothing could be further from the truth. I had a person tell me one time, he come up to me, he says, Hey, Brother Rick, how you doing, you old Campbellite you? I looked at that man and I told him I did not appreciate what he said. Not only did he say it to me, but there was others around listening to the conversation. And I rebuked him at that very moment. I said, brother, this is not what you're supposed to call your brother in Christ. We are Christians. We're not Campbellites. Well, he put his head down and nothing else was said about that by him to me. We have to stand for the truth. That's all there is to it. I have copies of photos that show that people didn't believe that Campbell's didn't start the church. These people were not able to stand against the truth, and so they reverted to name-calling. But in one of my documents that I am in possession of was a picture of a historical marker. This historical marker is located in Boston, northeast of Boston, Massachusetts, its number is 1630-1930, and here's what it states. Church of Christ, 1710, Meeting House of the Church of Christ in Rumney Marsh, erected in 1710. Thomas Cheever, the first settled minister, died December 27, 1749, aged 91 years. And this is a photo of, uh, there's a photo of that that I possess of this, this marker that was there, and it was in the Firm Foundation, volume number 88, number 18, dated May 4th, 1971. Here's what's interesting about it. Thomas Campbell was born in 1753. This is 43 years after that congregation had been established. Alexander Campbell, born in 1788, 78 years after that congregation had been established. No, the Campbells did not start the Church of Christ in the United States of America, nor did they start over in the countries of Scotland or Ireland. They came to an understanding of what the Church of Christ was after having arrived here, mainly, and I guess, based upon their own studies and from the help of others 
that we're going to talk about in just a moment. Because you say there are many influential events that transpired, Thomas Campbell began to feel the disunity in Christendom. Back in 1805, he tried to reunite the Presbyterian Church, but that failed. He even went to Scotland to beg the leaders there to get back together to reunite, but that failed as well. In America, Thomas was threatened with his life, threatened with death, by the, but the law of the land saved him. The land of the home, the land of the free and the brave. We know also that before Alexander had left Scotland, that he severed his ties with the Presbyterian Church. And the Presbyterians had this belief that elders could be the elders and rule over many congregations, not just one, but many congregations. The elders in the Presbyterian Church would interview people to determine if they were really worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper. And that wasn't scriptural. Based on this disagreement with the elders over who can partake of the communion, Thomas and Alexander Campbell both severed their ties with the Presbyterians. One didn't know the other had done it until they met once again in America. Thomas and Alexander Campbell, upon arrival, discussed their beliefs. Neither knew the other had severed those ties with the Presbyterian Church. They were overjoyed to see how each had gone to the Bible for authority in all things. It wasn't what this one thought or what that one thought. It's what does the Bible say? That was their proof text. During this time period, there were many influential people during this time. There was other restorationers at that time. There was Barton W. Stone, who lived in Kentucky and Ohio. He had a, uh, a conversation with the Campbells many times as he came up with them. He would fight against those man-made creeds and take the Bible as the basis for the Christian union. He took the name Christian, set forth on the mission of teaching others that the child of God is a Christian under that name. Raccoon John Smith was another one, Tennessee Baptist preacher formerly, who learned the faith and began to teach the truth. Campbell said of him that he's the only man he knew that an education would have ruined or spoiled. There was Walter Scott in that day and time, very influential in spreading the gospel. He provided the evangelistic fervor for the restoration movement of that day and time. Talbert Fanning accompanied Campbell on campaigns and was highly influenced by what Campbell had to teach and say. Talbert, however, was a free-thinking man as well, and he was willing to confront Alexander Campbell when he disagreed with his positions and what he had to say. He had to be proven wrong or right. There was Philip Slater Fall, and here's a, per a person that I'd never heard of before this study. And so, again, I'm thankful for the opportunity and the privilege to study this topic. This Philip Slater Fall, he came to Nashville, and he converted nearly a whole Baptist church at the start, the, in order to start the New Testament church in Nashville. Nearly 200 members were added to that movement. His sister Charlotte married Talbot Fanning back in December 22, 1836. There are so many more that we could talk about that it would be good to study about how their efforts affected the restoration movement. Holy.